Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, good to uh, see all of you here. Uh, and I must say, I, I really love this format. Um, you know, there's something quite uh, disarming about it. Uh, you know, uh, talking about your work, but then not showing any of your work. So um, what I want to do is actually just keep it kind of quite biographical uh, and in a way talk a little bit about what shaped me in life and how I got basically to the place where I am now, here today, and what I'm doing and, and how I'm kind of organizing that. And I think what's interesting about it is that I, I anyway um, firmly believe that the work of architects is always very biographical. So not only is it the biography of the architect that is engaged, but also projects take quite a long time. You know, some projects take five or nine or ten years, and the, the clients you work with, the contractors you work with, the advisors you work with, you're all part of this process. And you know, these buildings that we work on, they become part of our biographies. You know, they become part of our lives. So um, I always think the architecture is very much a, a people's business, and it's also about being able to deal with all sorts of people. Um, so, you know, this image is basically, you could say, the house I, I grew up in. I, I, I grew up in a, in a very small village in Herveld. Uh, for those of you who know it, we had, I think, 3,000 inhabitants at the time. And my parents bought an old farm. Uh, they were kind of hippies, you could say. Uh, and they, re they renovated that farm many, many times. Um, so we grew up on the countryside, and there was, there was actually a very very little in terms of intellectual stimulus in the countryside. Um, my parents were both uh, university taught, um, and they had, of course, quite a lot of books. My father was a professor of law, um, and but he had quite little books on art. Uh, but at the young age already, I was totally fascinated by, uh, by art and by artists. And um, my parents, they had one book on, on Rembrandt, and they had another book on Picasso, and there were these kind of large books that yeah, they would have in these uh, bookshelves. And when I was, uh, I think, eight, uh, eight and a half, I had to do a kind of um, presentation at school, uh, show and tell. And, you know, I, uh, I based the presentation on a comparison between the work of Rembrandt and, P and Picasso, um, which um, I, I wrote a whole uh, uh, piece about when I was eight, and I made a lot of comparisons between the different uh, paintings. Uh, of course, I got extremely little response from my uh, farmer school, uh, uh, you know, kids. Um, so you can imagine my youth was not very easy. I was actually bullied qu quite a bit <laughs> for being uh, maybe a little bit different than uh, anyone else. But these were the kind of things that really fascinated me as a, as a kid. Um, so then when I was around nine years old, my, my father, um, who was, who was, he was, you know, uh, was, he became a professor of law and he went to work in Berkeley, California. And we moved with a family to Berkeley, California because my father was going to teach there. And, you know, being from the Dutch countryside, going to Berkeley, California was a total culture shock. It was the absolute inverse of uh, growing up in the countryside in, uh, in Holland because, of course, this was uh, definitely, you could say, kind of cosmopolitan context where, you know, people were extremely engaging. Uh, they were uh, stimulating your intellectual curiosity. You know, they would applaud you for, com for basically comparing uh, Rembrandt and uh, Picasso, for instance. So, you know, that, that year was, I would say, very formative for, for, for us as a family, but also for me as a, as a kid. Um, you know, for instance, one of the one of the friends of my parents I met there, he, uh, because I was painting, he also really liked the fact that I was painting, and he would keep on stimulating me to paint, even you know for years after. So, you know, these were kind of you could say, giving a very different perspective on on culture, and I think especially also on uh, on, on on the way you can live, because we lived in 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 in, in this kind of house in California, and. Um, so we lived in a house from the, from the 60s, you could say kind of a case study house, where um, you would basically come in through the living room, you know, uh, in Holland you would see it on TV at, let's say, the Cosby Show or something, you would think like, ah, that's a studio house, who comes in through the living room, you know? Well, in California people actually do come in through the living room. Um, but also uh, the smell, you know, I mean the wood was all, you could say, uh, you know, and there was even some redwood in the house, so you would have this very particular smell of, of wood. You have the fog in the morning, 
And of course, these very thin walls, everything was basically not isolated, uh, insulated. So it was a very fascinating outlook. And after a one, let's say more or less one and a half year, we moved back to the Dutch <laughs> countryside, which, you know, actually uh, we thought as kids, we thought it was really uh, the worst thing ever of my parents to do was to move back to Herveld with 3,000 inhabitants in the middle of nowhere where basically we were being paraded around in a village like, look, these kids can talk English, you know, like, <laughs> and we had to perform at the local shop. They would ask us, Nana, please speak English, you know. <laughs> and then I would speak English and I said, wow, <laughs> this kid is speaking English. So, um, so, but that was, I think, you know, quite, quite uh, funny coming back to that context. At the same time, um, the high school I went to was, was a kind of very, funny place. Um, it was a high school with um, quite a few teachers that also had this kind of hippie spirit. And somehow um, the arts teachers there, they were very um, enthusiastic and they were extremely engaging. And um, this is actually a picture of myself. Of course, you can see it playing the drums there. But here in front playing the flute is, is Martin Baas, the, the furniture designer who was actually in the same school and we had the same art teacher. And this art teacher, Peter Buchweit, he was extremely stimulating uh, to both of us to really becoming artists and, and, and architects. And um, I guess we were very, very lucky with that, that in this kind of uh, shithole of a village, uh, there was this kind of spark of uh, culture and, uh, and depth. One of the things that uh, really caught my kind of immense fascination uh, when I was, I think, around 15, 16 was, was the work of Theo van Doesburg and the style. I started to read up a lot about it, um, and I started to research a lot about it. I really uh, was extremely fascinated with this idea of abstract space, and I really tried to understand it. It's also one of the main reasons I wanted to go and study architecture. I also studied a lot about the Bauhaus, but the Bauhaus kind of even grabbed me more because it was also very much about how to get it done, you know? Basically, also the whole model of education in the Bauhaus was about first learning the craft, and from the craft, learning to use your imagination and your abstraction to actually then design. So uh, when I you know, went to study architecture, um, I was first went to Delft and to Eindhoven to look at the universities, but I thought they were very abstract uh, and, and very disengaged with reality. And I actually consciously chose to go to the HTS, to the technical school first, to become first, let's say, a draftsman, and then after to do my master's to become an architect. So basically kind of follow the Bauhaus model. And it was an extremely good choice because that's how I met my wife, uh, Nolly, Nolly Voss. So 25 years ago, we fell in love and we're still uh, very much in love and, and, and together. And we studied architecture together at the technical school. And that was quite an amazing time. It was also the time that the NIE, and the NIE was just founded. And this is actually a picture of of an uh, exhibition by Daniel Liebeskind in 1998, 25 years ago, when I just fell in love with my wife. Um, and we took a train to Rotterdam to see the exhibition of Daniel Liebeskind. And um, what is amazing about it is that Daniel Liebeskind had a huge exhibition, even though he hadn't really built anything yet, you know. Uh, and there were huge models, there was a lot of drawings, it was all extremely dense in terms of uh, conviction and information, and it was extremely inspiring. So. Um, that was basically, you could say, um, the background I got my education in. And then I went to the Berlake Institute here in Rotterdam, which was also very much, you could say, a kind of a free haven for uh, thinkers. Uh, our dean was Wiel Adets. We had teachers such as Winnie Maas, um, uh, Rem Kohlhaas, Stefano Boeri. Um, but I guess the greatest thing about that moment of education was that there was no accreditation at the Berlake. So the program was extremely open. And as students, we were able to basically debate uh, our own assignments and we were able to challenge uh, the curriculum and come up with our own curriculum. And that really, um, I guess, told me a lot. Uh, and afterwards, I went to work for, uh, for Rem Kohlhaas. And the funny thing was that at the Berlage, um, you could say almost all the, uh, all the uh, students wanted to work at OMA. Um, because I was the only Dutch person and uh, all the other students were coming from abroad. And I, as a Dutch person, wasn't so eager to work at OMA because I knew the, the relentless hours you had to make there. Um, but, but Ram was my teacher and then he asked me to come and work for him so I could hardly refuse. 
and I worked there for two years, mainly on very large uh, kind of urban planning uh, studies and uh, more on the AMO side. Um, and it was actually a really intense time, and I, I think back about it quite a lot. I learned a lot from that uh, period, but it was also, I think, a way of working that I really didn't like so much in terms of the way the uh, office culture was. So I guess now you would call it a very toxic uh, working environment because you know, it was an extremely harsh uh, mentality. Um, we worked easily 100 hours a week. We always worked at least one night uh, through, one all-nighter every week. Uh, so, uh, and besides that, of course, there was a lot, some kind of bullying going on. There was kind of, you could say, a certain lack of safety, or you could say a certain amount of transgression. But at the same time, that also uh, allowed the office to do quite astonishing and amazing things. So there was also, of course, the other side to it. All the hours that you put in also resulted to a kind of insane production. And I must also say that I really learned um, somehow, it was a bit like going to the Marine Corps, you know, like doing two years of ultra hard boot camp. So you kind of were able to deal with, with almost anything afterwards. At least that's a bit how I felt about it, you know. Um, and I worked on countless uh, projects in that time, amongst others also the exhibition here in the, uh, in the console. And we had some really fun moments, like the moment when Brad Pitt came by. I'm still kind of super happy with that <laughs> picture. So that's Brad Pitt, that's Ram Koas, that's me. You know, it's like, and Oli Shere, like, oh, you know. Uh, yeah, so that was super nice, and, and I remember that Brad Pitt was, um, he, he was mainly saying things like, oh, that's so cool, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in his kind of Brad Way style. And Ram, of course, explained, well, you know, this and that and that and that, yeah, that's so cool. Um, so then after two years of that, I, I was really kind of uh, uh, done with it, in a way, even though it was also kind of slightly addictive to work in that kind of, bubble place, which really um, is like a, almost a kind of universe in itself. Um, I really wanted to get out of it and, and, and start my own office. And I had two really good friends from the Berlage, uh, Charles Bassar and, and Alexander Sverdlov. And we were kind of young and cocky and we said, okay, let's start a company. And we started a company and we said it should have a really long name because all the Dutch companies at the time had really short names like Next, Must, uh, Dus, Zus. Uh, must, uh, and we were like, yeah, you know, let's make a really long name. And first we had Powerhouse Fortune Company, which is even longer. But we were so incredibly poor and broke that uh, we thought the fortune was that's totally preposterous, you know. <laughs> so we called it Powerhouse Company because that sounded kind of still cool enough. Um, and after one year, um, um, Alexander Sverdlov uh, left, but um, Charles and, and, and I, we, we continued for, for, quite a, for quite a time, for, for 10 years. Uh, Charles was my partner and he was working from Copenhagen, I was working from Rotterdam. And it was very nice because Charles is, is French from origin um, and I'm Dutch, he was living in Copenhagen. So we were having a, always a very interesting international collaboration and also a lot of different perspectives on the way we would work. Charles had worked for Jean Nouvel another titan uh, with uh, transgressive office behavior. So, um, but, but we both really um, learned a lot from them in, in terms of engaging with, 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 uh, with, with our practice. And um, it's also around the time that we had kids, me and my wife, these are my, my three kids. Um, and it's funny that um, it was also a very conscious decision to start the office and the kids at the same time. Um, because I was thinking like, shall we first start the office or shall we first have kids? And we said, well, either way it's going to be a bad choice, so let's do it at the same time, which was also a bad choice. So, um, but it was, also, it was also the time that, uh, around that time, so this was you know, quite an important moment in my life, biographically speaking, because it was also the time that my, my mother passed away, um, which you know, was, of course, extremely uh, sad. And, um, Interesting thing is we grew up in this farm, you know, which uh, my parents bought together and they rebuilt it and my parents were extremely close. So, um, and I was extremely close to my mom and not so much to my dad who was a lawyer. My mom was a French teacher. Um, and when my mom passed away, my father really couldn't live in the farm anymore. He said, well, it's too tough for me to live in the farm and I would really like to explore 
an entirely different future than the kind of, let's say, intimacy of the farm, which is really about looking inward, and it's really about this kind of super cozy space. And he said, if I would buy a piece of land, could you design something like this for me, you know? Which um, was, for me, a really uh, kind of uh, emotional question, of course, because I was never super close with my father. And, um, of course, at the same time, I was also ex extremely triggered, you know? Like, well, do you know what it means <laughs> to design something like that, you know? Uh, so I started questioning about him about how would you really want to live, and he said, well, I want, I want to basically have the openness of the farmer's house, but it would also be very nice if it would have something of the monumentality of, of Palladio, you know, <laughs> because my father is he's educated, I mean, he, he, he did his research, and he is also fascinated by architecture, he said, well, you know, Palladio is also amazing. Like, you have this fantastic views. It would be great if it would have something like this. But also, it would be if it would have the intimacy of the of the of the farm. You know, so basically, can you do a kind of a farm, the intimacy of a farm, and the kind of uh, central organization of Palladio, and then the kind of loftiness of uh, of Mies. Well, anyway, that was a whole story, and, and that's how we came up with our first project, uh, Villa One project, which, which was a very emotional project for, for, for myself and my father, and, and, and we also became extremely good friends through that project, and, and um, I never lecture about it. Uh, this is the only place I would lecture about it, because my father always asked me not to talk about it in, in that sense, because it's, it's his... Um, it's also his privacy that he, he, he enjoys, but he also thinks it's okay to, to speak about it in this particular context. Um, and unfortunately, um, um, you could say sometimes um, these kind of horrible events also lead to kind of beautiful moments. And I guess that was the start of, uh, of for me, a really great uh, career as well. So it was always a very double side to it. But I also learned a lot from my father and the way he was a client. He was extremely engaged as a client. He was also very, um, uh, not only engaged, but also very clear about his desires. And it set me on a kind of track where I started to really analyze architecture, not only from the point of view of the architect, like what we're doing today, like we're talking about the biographies of architects, but not necessarily about what you design. But I think if you look at architecture through the eyes of the client, you also see that every great project has a great client. And, you know, this is Roby, um, Frederick Roby, who was the client of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and he had a motorcycle factory uh, from his father, Frederick Roby. Um, but he was so incredibly obsessed with um, getting things done in his particular way that he also designed his own car, which this is the, own, this is the car that Frederick Roby designed. And this is a driver driving him around in his own car. Um, and Frederick Roby then uh, asked Frank Lloyd Wright to design the Roby house for him, and Frank Lloyd Wright designed that house, and it was so particular according to the wishes of Roby that actually Frank Lloyd Wright, in the end, when it was finished, said, well, you know, I'm actually not the architect, Mr. Roby is the architect, and that's why I'm calling it the Roby house, you know, because Roby was so incredibly uh, visionary. He wanted to have the living room on the first floor, he wanted to have the particular walled garden, he wanted to have the big, uh, the big roof spans, you know, all these kind of themes of design were actually brought by the client, you know, so, um, and the same actually would go for Louis Kahn, who is one of my, you know, one of my <coughs> personal heroes, um, you know, this is one of the first sketches of the Salk Institute, uh, actually uh, Louis Kahn made four different designs for the Salk Institute, because Mr. Salk, the client, was an extremely visionary client who had a really clear idea about how he wanted to create uh, the ideal uh, laboratory. And if you go there nowadays to the Salk Institute, um, it's still functioning and it's still working and it's still a very productive space, you know, which is not only because of Louis Kahn, but definitely also because of uh, Salk. So I think in our own work as well, we often really try to focus on finding really good clients and. You know, this is, for instance, a villa we've done in Munich with a fantastic client who's been in super engaged, um, like almost obsessively engaged. Um, but also then we became also, let's say, our, our own client. Uh, we started, this is an old office building where we were in with, with you know, uh, with our office. 
um, and it was empty for a long time. It had amazing views. Uh, not a single developer wanted to buy it because it was 2011, 2012, after the crisis. And I was very restless at that time, and I thought, you know, if nobody wants to uh, develop this into a fantastic project, I will do it myself. So um, I found a way to, to finance it, to, to be able to buy the building, with an excuse to basically make apartments into it, to turn all these uh, floors into apartments, and then to build our own house on the top of the roof, which, of course, was totally the hidden agenda of the project. Um, so this is, this is our house on top of the roof. Um, and um, I really learned a lot from that idea that if sometimes if you really want things, you simply have to push really way beyond your comfort zone and, and, and get it done. So, um, and, and at the same time, I also think that, um, you know, these two books have also been massively important uh, uh, to me. Um, on the one hand, of course, the book by Piketty, which is very much about the consequences of the a neoliberal state we're in with the world, you know, basically uh, the deregulation of, uh, of all our welfare societies um, have led to the fact that architecture, of course, is, is kind of marginalized and left more and more to the, uh, to the uh, economic sector. And this also was very much described in the book by René de Graaf, who was my old, uh, let's say, my old boss at AOME, um, and he makes a very good analysis of how the architecture profession is, uh, is more and more marginalized. But for me, the conclusion was, um, let's, let's engage, you know, let's also develop. So I founded a development company called Real Estate Development Company. Um, and with that we, we develop also very, we say, a very passionate project, like this is a building by Maaskant, one of, also one of my favorite architects. And as developers we were actually able to, to buy it, uh, this abandoned building, which um, had been more or less, uh, you know, uh, pushed away by the university, it used to belong to the university, it was a cultural center, the university uh, basically saying like, look, it's not our core, it's not our core business to engage in culture, uh, we need to sell the building, so they sold it. And as developers, we were able to buy it and then fully restore it because we were able to also build a, a tower in it, which, you know, which is able to basically then finance the entire project and revitalize the entire project and also then restore the, uh, restore the Mascon building. Um, it allows us also to create projects like the floating office, which you know, is the largest floating office in the world, et cetera, et cetera, but also super sustainable. And, um, and we were able to build it in 18 months because of our, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say combination of being a client and an architect. And with the floating office, we were also able to then <coughs> do the last step, which is also create a construction company basically to then also build what we develop and what we design. Um, yeah, so that's basically more or less you could say what, what it's led to in the last eight years. Now we are in a situation where we have amassed a kind of totally absurd um, portfolio of, uh, of developments. Um, but at the same time also extremely capable of doing public projects with, let's say, real passion and understanding on how to get them done, such as, for instance, the library here in, uh, in Rotterdam. So, to finish it off, like, um, of course you could say, like, being an architect is always about trying to engage with reality, right? To get things done and to get things built. And um, you could say sometimes this is almost like a kind of Faustian pact where you have to kind of maybe sell your soul to the devil or not. Um, you could also say that maybe being an architect and a developer is being like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that you have this kind of two sides uh, and that you are maybe sometimes uh, the kind of uh, half evil person. Um, but I think in the end, uh, what it's all about is, is trying to be a Trojan horse and trying to find a way to uh, insert architecture into everything what you're doing and to find a way to realize uh, your dreams and uh, and your ambitions uh, through through architecture. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you a lot. We knew some of the some of the slides from the last presentation, but uh, we didn't know about the construction company because that was an idea about uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, when we see that, I wonder what's the secret. How do you manage to do? Uh, the most out of the out out of, of oh, sorry, out of your time. The most how do you manage doing the most out of your time, and still 
without driving you crazy? I guess you are not working 100 hours a week as you did at that time. No, I'm, I'm working not 100 hours, but 80? slightly less. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, that's also, it's a diff I get that question quite a lot. Um, but I, I find it a very difficult question to answer because um, for me it's uh, very uh, natural and it's, it's actually <laughs> quite easy, so to say. Um, because it's really about just simply uh, doing one thing, learning from it, doing another thing, learning from it, and then just building up on that knowledge and just pushing, 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 and, and you know, keep on going, and then just basically at some point it all is actually pretty yeah, but logical. I yeah. guess also finding the right people to yeah. uh, collaborate with, because sure. three companies now are even more stressed. Yeah, that, that's, that's of course also super important, so I, I think in general that, you know, um, Architecture is very much a team sport. You know, we work on all our projects with, with a lot of people. Um, so it's also about trusting people, finding the right talent, finding a way to, to keep them. You know, I, I, I always thought it was, uh, you know, when you think about OMA, for instance, or, or any other big office, like um, so many good people left OMA, like it would have been amazing if they would have stayed, you know, right? So. How do you how do you keep good people, for instance? You know things that are on my mind. How to keep good people? How to how to stimulate a great working environment? You know that's why we have a swimming pool next to our office, for instance. And um, we're and all invited. We're all invited, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so you know, I, I think all these things are kind of part of it. You know. But how do you um, jokes apart? How do you make sure that the good people stay as part of your team? Well, I don't know. I think it's interesting, like now going through these slides and thinking about again about my own uh, upbringing. I also think like uh, that I had to, I was extremely uh, blessed that I gr I was that I grew up in, in in a very nice family, you know, with with two parents who loved each other and that gave me a lot of trust. And and I think that that it also allows me to trust people and and it mm. allows me to also project that trust. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, in a way, the way I, I want to run my office is also that it feels a bit like a family, you know, that it feels a bit like a place where people uh, can work hard but also feel relaxed at the same time, you know, like that's the ideal picture I have in mind. Uh, so I guess I'm also just a really lucky bastard that I, you know, um, that I grew up with these fantastic parents, for instance, that were able to give me that, that love and background, you know. There is something... <coughs> Time is, of course, tight. Um, there are two things I would love to ask you, and one is mentioning family. Is, of course, we have been following your work, but after the talk, even um, more um, what you do. And one of the things that you have done this um, years is traveling to Ghana with your kids, with your mm -hmm. family, and you were not just uh, visiting around, but you were also visiting the, like the, um, exploring the impact of the Dutch colonialism mm -hmm. there, and so on. So not just for fun, but also deep, deep information. I guess mm. was passed to the kids. What mm. wanted? What do you? What did you want to pass, or what did you want your kids to learn about being there? Hmm. Well, so Ghana for me definitely, and our Africa in general, but Ghana in particular has a very special place for me. Uh, I, I was there for the first time ten years ago, and I and when I was in Ghana, I, I never realized. It was for me the first time that I was in really, like, physically uh, confronted with with the Dutch slave trading past. You know, seeing the slave trading forts in uh, in Ghana, and uh, for me it was really a moment when I thought my kids have to see this. You know, I have to educate them about this. I have to do something with that. I have to make them conscious of the fact that this is part of our biography as well. You know. Um, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that my mother was a French teacher, and, and, and she was uh, a kind of totally insane tour guide if we had any holiday. So she had three guides. She always had the, the, um, this French guide called the... Uh, how's it called, the French guide? The guy with the big backpack with the globe on the back. Nobody knows? Yeah, like, well, the, the, globe, the globe something, right? So she had a French guide, she had a Dutch guide and an English guide, and wherever we went, she was always saying, like, well, the French guide is saying this, the Dutch guide is saying this, and the English guide is saying that, you know. And then, so she would always, wherever we went, was always a huge 
let's say, uh, cultural event, and we visited many churches and so on. Uh, she was not so much into modern uh, art. That was definitely what I brought to the table at some point. But I think it's also something I have from my mother that I, I do enjoy going on holiday when I can also educate. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting also for the three kids in the age that they are. Yes. Um, how old are they? They're mm -hmm. in purity now. Yeah. Mm, dangerous. It's very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, last we will survive. They will, yeah. <laughs> well, a last question is we often talk about success. I mean, I mean, the list of projects and you have been involved is impressive and we are getting even more. <coughs> um, uh, very interesting projects coming up for the next years. But could you share a professional fair, uh, fail that happened to you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean... One of them, I know. Yeah, I know. You know, there's this... There, there, there's, there's this... Uh, <laughs> there's this really... Uh, there, there is this... Uh, there was this lecture series called Fuck Up Nights. I know, I know that. And uh, I was on it, and, and I showed, actually, a few of the fuck-ups, and it's really horrible. I did this. I did this one, which is really horrible. And near Batavia-Stad in Lely, in Lely Stad, if you're ever there, Batavia-Stad, there's a there's a French fries pavilion there, and there's a, f a fish restaurant there, which I both designed, and they're like totally awful, and everything went wrong, and, and marriages broke up, and you know, etc. So, yeah, I'll confess. Yeah. I and mean, what did you t take out from those? Well, what I took out from that is that you know I, I started on these two quite simple uh, commissions. One was to do a fish restaurant. The other one was to do a French fries restaurant, and and I totally overestimated uh, my role as an architect. You know, I wanted to make uh, like unbeatable icons out of these two projects, which was totally <laughs> not what they wanted. You know, they wanted a fish restaurant and a French fries restaurant. You know, and there I was, an architect. Yeah, I'm going to make you know the next Elko Key cover building. You know, well. Uh, yeah. Did you bring a picture of Palladio as well? <laughs> no, <Like, laughs> for sure, amongst <laughs> others. You know, amongst <laughs> others. No, so. No, definitely. I mean, I think what I learned from that is that, you know, architecture is in essence uh, quite a humble profession, honestly. And I think one of the big problems is that architects are trained in a way, in, 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 in kind of in a way that they are made to believe that, that they are some kind of superstars that are working on projects alone, you know, uh, coming up with the genius all by themselves, you know. Uh, and that every project they do has to be something really special and something really different and that nobody's ever done before, you know. Well, that. I learned that it's really not about that at all. It's really about finding the right balance with the client and the site, you know, and your own ambition. And if that, if that coincides really well, you know, like in the Villa One project or, or like uh, in, the, in the Bunker Tower project then, or in the Floating Office project then, you know, then you can create something really nice and have a lot of fun, but then you can also share it with a lot of people. But if you try to like over push your own ambition and your own design ambition, then quite often at least it is pure to horror and tragedy. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Nana, for your talk <laughs> and for the interview. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you a lot. Thank you. <laughs>